Right, this video is intended to provide a concise version of my counter theory, my counter model, my counter argument to the conventional interpretation of basic experiments <clears throat> like the double slit experiment in explaining uh, how light behaves and how the mechanics of the universe function and why the conventional theory is not very well founded, is not supported by the evidence. The evidence, in fact, um, basically confirms that theirs is the wrong answer. <laughs> if analyzed fairly and um, with some kind of uh, effort to find the truth rather than to sell a story of reality. So, in brief, the conventional theory is that a single source of light encounters a slit or two slits that the light does in fact, at these points, that's the mathematical fact, um, produce uh, a disturbance that 95% maybe of the light does go straight through <laughs> and that some percentage creates what are called fringes, and this creates a pattern, an on-off pattern, the simplest pattern in the universe. And that this is to perplex us and force us to believe that things that seem quite discrete, um, that travel very straight paths, land in very small areas of surfaces, we are to believe that going through the slit meant it creates a copy of itself that somehow interferes with that copy of itself in some superimposed position of all the possible paths, and it chooses to land in some location, and it's all very mysterious, very wooey, very, uh, not very reasonable. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the simple fact is, is that the truth is, is that in all the mathematics, whether it's a double slit or a single slit, if I make a double slit, I just change the number of point sources. The mathematics that works has four point sources, clearly indicating the surfaces are everything to the experiment. And that can be understood because the point, the surfaces are basically a definition of a distance. The distance, <clears throat> the widest distance and the shortest distance between two surfaces, indicating possible vectors where one could expect to accomplish the task of bringing these lines together um, with a wavelength of distance difference. Now again, this, is, this video is intended for people who are going to make a counter argument and know something about the physics. So I shouldn't have to explain path length differences and wavelength differences. But the simple truth is, is the pattern is fundamentally just created by measuring those distances. So if it's a single slit, I just measure this distance. It's two point sources. I just divide how many wavelengths fit inside of there. And that'll tell me exactly how many of these nodes I'm going to get on an equidistant line. It'll tell me exactly how many it will end up on this surface. I'll know that the furthest, the longest path length difference between the two lines is going to be here at 90 degrees. That's where the two lines have the biggest difference. And that difference is going to be the exact difference, okay? So if there's 14.4 wavelengths, if you divide lambda into the distance and you get an, a non-whole number, that remainder is telling you something. If it was 0.5, it's going to be telling you that you would, this starting point at 90 degrees is going to be out of phase. Disruptive interference by your rhetoric, what I would call it, would be just absence of reconstruction, that the phase is broken, it's the wrong phase, the signal has essentially been jammed, and you won't receive it. I right, can't see the 90 degrees, but 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> and if I made a string, just tied a string onto these two things and moved the string with notches on it, with the notches of this wavelength here, when I get to this top, I'll end up with half the notches on one string, half the notches on the other string. And actually, if I did have a 0.5 remainder, <clears throat> half of 14.5 would be 7.25. So here, at a point where I have constructive, because they're both equidistant, the fact is, is they're not. <laughs> okay, the fact is, is that the notches won't line up. So even though I'm going to have a false uh, center there, and the trick is, is that that is a false. In all the other comparisons, you're comparing two lanes, lines that are moving in the same direction. And only, in this case, inside this tiny millimeter of distance, inside the difference of the slit, which is 1.5 of a millimeter, actually, um, <coughs> is this little occurrence going to take place. It's going to take place in a tiny piece of space. And the real pattern starts here and here. And this just fills in the blank. The size of the laser, essentially, the spread of the laser beam going right through the middle fills in this difference. And so that's why the center maxima is twice as big, a little bit more than twice in most cases, than <coughs> the rest of the nodes is because it's actually a fake. It's really two separate nodes, two separate nodes that started at the right distances, you know, where this is a straight line, the shortest distance for this line, uh, less than the shortest distance for that one, obviously. And that's where the node actually started. And because it started with a 0.5 down here, you can understand it's probably starting with a 0.5 at the head end, and then just start drawing your nodes. So they've implied that this is an infinite pattern, which it certainly is not. 
there's a specific number of nodes, and this, the number of nodes, the number of fringes, will be completely dictated by how many wavelengths fit between the distances. So if I made a double slit experiment, instead of a single slit, you can understand <coughs> that the nodes, the surfaces, there'd be four surfaces now. So the single slit is really the two surface experiment, two sources of scatter, two sources. That, and this is really the four surface experiment. And all you're really doing is saying these two outside surfaces, a lot of wavelengths fit inside of them. That means small nodes. These two interior surfaces have a short distance. That means they're going to create the envelope, the big pattern. And where you can line up three or four of these vectors, where you're in phase over these four sources, that's where you get a bright. There is no destructive interference. There's been no real experiment done where they ever showed any light spot getting dark. That is, if I covered one of the, like I opened the slit and a certain amount of light hits the surface. No experiment has ever shown that if I open the slit, more light hits someplace. You know, like some place that was dark. It's in some place that was light gets dark. Uh, there's no experiment showing that. So that's a fallacy. And the other fallacy is the detector experiments. No detector could ever be built for an electron or a photon especially. There's no passive way to ever detect a photon. It would be theoretical nonsense. And even if you could build such a detector, the odds are you couldn't fit it in the experiment because it's got to be so tiny. So those are just nonsense stories. Part of the propaganda. What makes this work, what makes particles work even better, is understanding what light is. Just like uh, uh, any, other radio, any other radio signal or any other photonic signal, it's basically antenna dependent. So we know that uh, the longer your wavelength, the, the wider your frequency, the bigger your frequency, the taller your antenna can be. So the more time you have to run energy up the antenna to create your signal. And the polarization of that light will be, the, that signal will basically be antenna polarization. The theory is that, go, and this goes right down to microwaves with a three centimeter, uh, you know, antenna because that's the only speed uh, at three centimeters at the speed of light that's as far as you can get before you have to have the next wave and the next wave and the next wave the signal is stopping and starting before it can get any further up the antenna that's why the rest of the antenna is superfluous and useless it's because you don't have enough time to send energy up the longer antenna so frequency is controlling um, in both directions and that's essentially polarization and the truth is that the atoms of a surface are also an antenna and the truth is, is that there's a correlation between the frequency of light, that is the distance between the events of creating a photon. So I'm arguing that a photon is made out of um, corpuscles, um, but it's not one corpuscle. You don't have a 500 megahertz corpuscle. You don't have a you don't have you don't have a, <clears throat> a 500 nanometer distance between. I mean, of a, of a size of a, a photon. Photons aren't 500 nanometers big. The, the frequency is 500 nanometers. That is the period between, okay, at the speed of light of the photon. So the photon is made of quanta, clumps of energy, clumps of momentum at a frequency. And that would be quite consistent with what you're allowed to say with waves. We understand that if we're gonna make a wave theory, the waves aren't one wave. We understand that it's wave, then wave, then wave. And that's the path length difference, that a photon can arrive at one side of the surface, travel a longer distance, show up at a secondary time to create, recreate the wave function that the wave isn't something that happens instantaneously, that the wave happens over a period of time. And the same would be true for a particle theory. It would be made of wavelets. It would be made out of clumps, uh, particles. And the key is, is that the fact is, is when it's created in an atoms, in a, in a crystal of metal, or some other crystal, most, most all photons are created by crystals, that the energy actually has to travel through the material. The photon is essentially created by moving an electron quickly. When the electron moves quickly, it takes all the force that was between it and the new location and essentially collects all that force, collects all of it, and sends it all at once. So it sends a clump of energy. It could be five of these quanta, it could be 50 of these quanta. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then the next atom that fires, an electron, that pushes an electron, does the same thing. So these move the speed of light away, and then another clump you know, is created, and they move the speed of light, and then another clump is created, and they move the speed of light. And so what you end up with is uh, clumps, Okay, at a period, all right, created by different uh, uh, at atoms. And so you could think of it, if you're just going to draw them as single pieces of quanta, the understanding would be as polarization is essentially just the fact that this distance is proportional to this distance, that is the frequency, and that the bits of the photon are out of alignment within that polarization. So the first one is here, the second one is here, the third piece here, the fourth piece here. That would be the idea. That would be its polarization. So it's traveling through space as a bunch of parallel bullets at a specific period. And um, so now 
once you take that understanding and throw that into the single slit experiment or the double slit experiment, you can clearly understand that what's really happening is that composite pieces, irritating, Ugh. God, I get a new cord, um, <clears throat> that this, what's happening on these surfaces is that these polarized bits of photon are going through and pieces of them are getting blocked off or knocked off. And then other pieces are hitting the electrons near the surface and they're being deflected, they're being scattered. That's what electrons do to photons, it scatters them. And the same thing's happening to here. And as we know, it's a small percentage of the light. If I make this slit wide, say 200 wavelengths wide, clearly lots of photons can get through there without being disturbed. That's why we get the very, very bright center in the single slit experiment. This means obviously a ton of the light will get through. Now, if I make this an impediment, the math is exactly the same. So if I just make this the single impediment experiment um, and have the same dimensions as the opening was, then you can understand, okay, the scatter is going to become more important because now you're blocking most of the direct light. You're only getting the fringe light. It's going next to the surfaces. And so now your pattern will be the same exact pattern, except you won't have this overwhelmingly bright center. Uh, and then the double slits doing the same thing. And here's the vectors are just work out perfectly sensible. It's the same exact mathematics. You just take this distance, okay, between the surfaces, and you understand how many wavelengths go into that distance. So you just divide the distance upside down. D won't do it by the wavelength. Uh, and that'll tell you exactly how many nodes you're going to get. And uh, now it's just a matter of positioning them. Like I said, if this comes out to be an, uh, a non-whole number, if you have any point remainder, you know that this first, the one the, the, the one at 90 degrees, oh gee, what happened to the camera there? That is disappointing. Well, so much for concise and direct and fast. But anyway, it's uh, have to do. All right, so the one at 90 degrees, if there's a remainder, you know it's going to be an off node. Um, if it's a 0.5, uh, it's a 0.25, then it's almost becoming a bright. It's the beginning of a bright. So all of that is figure outable, and the same thing again for the front. And so what I'm really arguing here is the photons coming in as a sequence, a period of events. This little piece might go this way, this piece might go over here, this piece might go straight through. Same thing's happening on this other surface, and all you're really doing is saying, where can I recombine the phase of these pieces? Where do they go back into an order where there's a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4? And it might be 5, might be 9, who knows how many you need to have a photon, but the point is, is that's what you're really counting and <clears throat> you're having these events arrive at a surface at the right timing. And from polarization, we sort of know that this isn't a, a single electron event. We know that a, a single photon's polarization, the wavelength is proportional to the polarization. We know the polarization is maybe a thousand atoms for visible light. A thousand atoms. How could one electron create a signal that has a, a size of a thousand atoms? That would be very unrealistic. But anyway, all you're really doing is recombining. So just from scatter alone, you're going to send energy to all locations. And all you're really saying is these locations, it's not a photon because it's not back in proper period. It's the phase is broken. The two clumps are too close together. The other two clumps are too far apart. Whatever the frequency is broken. So essentially, you can see it as a signal is jammed there. So if I was using two radar sources, as they claim, um, the jamming mathematics is exactly the same as wave interference. The mathematics for jamming is exactly the same. The same thing is happening here. You're just creating a photon that has a broken frequency. It can't be resolved as a photon. It's still energy, it's still clumps of quanta, but it's not a photon anymore. It can't eject an electron. It can't force an electron to move quickly and move back again. It can just vibrate it weakly. A weak vibration doesn't do anything. Just like a weak movement of a magnet into an inductor won't do anything. You have to move it quickly, and out of phase can't move it quickly. And so it's just not received as a photon. Where it's back in phase, it's allowed to hit an electron uh, to its resonant frequency. That is, the, the electron would obviously be in an atom. Uh, it's connected to a proton. Uh, it's connected to other electrons repulsively. And it's clearly in tension. And the idea is to hit it, get it moving. And before it can spring back, you've got to hit it again. And that's going to create a photon. That's going to create a piece of the electrical potential you need to create an electric current to make it possible for you to know a photon arrived. That's how we know a photon arrived is a, electrons have to create the, the, the electric current. That is, they have to force an electron to move from one atom to another atom to another atom to another atom. Um, they have to for, force that chain reaction. And um, so, uh, yeah, and so obviously that has to happen like a pendulum swing. You can't add energy to the system if you don't have the right frequency. And so photons have to have a consistent frequency or they can't add energy. And that's the simple rule. So if the frequency has a big, has two bits too close to each other, and then the third bit's too far away, 
it won't be able to add energy because here and here it'll be adding energy here it'll be subtracting it because the pendulum will be swinging the wrong way by the time this one shows up so you can sort of understand tipping point arguments they all work <clears throat> in terms of explaining why certain frequencies allow there to be a photon certain other frequencies won't um, and that they can't be broken and just like our radio receivers are frequency dependent um, the <clears throat> the photons we're sending have to be um, they have to have the right frequency or we just can't see them. They might reflect off the surface, but it won't do us any good because we can't see them unless they're red, bl blue, and green, or red, green, and yellow, or whatever colors you want to use. So anyway, so I think that's probably enough. So a, a particle model does work. A particle model clearly explains scatter, so the point should be emphasized. The Your model basically says that a wave comes into a surface and somehow makes a wave center here, and a wave here. But these are the wave centers. Your wave centers have to be on the surface, which means somehow the wave broke in the middle for no good reason, and somehow the wave went right through the surface, the, right through the substance, which we know it didn't do that either. That's the math that works. That's the drawing that works. Okay, so when they draw it in here, that's a lie. We know it. Uh, the Young double slit experiment isn't reasonable math. It's unreasonable math. When Young takes this complex uh, machinery, in the sense it has four surfaces, and resorts to this, Two waves, two waves interfering, will not give you the correct answer. It doesn't create the correct pattern. They're not the right, the nodes aren't the right size, and they're not in the right positions. It doesn't work. So it's kind of fake science. Young's drawings don't work. The math that works acknowledges the existence of four surfaces, four point sources, four waves. So you have to draw your waves in these preposterous locations where they're half over, like somehow the wave goes through the middle impediment and breaks at the center of the middle impediment. No logic can explain why it would do that. No logic would explain why these waves break in the middle of the opening. The waves are completely in the wrong place, but they're completely in the right place if you understand it's just about scattered. Little particles are flying through. The ones next to the surface get scattered. The ones that go through the middle don't. And the ones that are scattered have path length difference that reconstruct frequency. That's the simple, correct, logical, well-evidenced answer to the question of what a photon is and what's happening in this experiment. And with the particle model, there's no superposition, there's no splitting in two, there's no uh, in every position at once, uh, there's no uh, uh, breaking of cause and effect. There's no breaking of some simple explanation that everything has a path, everything follows a path, everything has a place in the three-dimensional space, and there's absolutely no need for any wooey crap. <laughs> so anyway, that's pretty much as brief as I can make it, I think, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so, I would like to hear the counter-argument, defending the conventional woo.